In the markets of Villa Hermosa, southern Mexico, David and Nikki Beard proudly show off their new baby. Los tres bebés son de ustedes. Yeah. yeah. That's Kelly, Blake, and Lachlan. When we found out it was triplets, I was just, I was just <laughs> over the moon. It's just... It's three times as much trouble. I don't mind. Mare? <laughs> Dos papas. Dos papas. Yeah. Ah, okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Despite being a same-sex couple with three surrogate kids in a conservative Catholic country... Girl. The beards are swamped with good wishes for their tiny babies. It's amazing, even in a month, they all, all already have their own little personalities. They're smiling at you, making yeah, eye contact. It's just, and every time they do that, you pick them up, they smile at you. It's like falling in love again. It's <laughs> Maybe surrounded by a million people, I still feel all alone. Just want to go home. This should be the most joyous time of their lives. Oh, I got to go home. But in reality, it's the most stressful and frightening. The moral of the story is, do not come to Mexico to have a surrogate child. David and Nikki are from Auckland, but now they and their babies are trapped in Mexico, victims of a complicated and corrupt surrogate baby trade. They're unsure who to turn to for help and unable to understand how things have gone so horribly wrong. We had looked at New Zealand and even Australia to see if we could just get a surrogate mother that would help us. We searched for four years and we really searched hard. We did not want to come to Mexico. We did not want to go to any other third world country. We wanted to have top hospitals um, with women that were looked after and were not vulnerable or ill-educated. We wanted the best and... You couldn't do that. We couldn't do it. Oh, come here, Bobs. David and Nikki were like thousands of other childless couples from Australia and New Zealand who are just desperate to be parents. Overseas surrogacy is often their only option, but exploitation Hello. is rampant. Are you hungry? Are you happy now? Definitely naively, maybe foolishly, the Beards picked a surrogacy company that's now under investigation by Mexican police. So why did you choose surrogacy Cancun, Mexico? I had probably the best correspondence with them. Really quick responses, gave me all the information that I asked for. I know, aren't your brothers annoying? At first, the Beards liked what they were hearing from Surrogacy Cancun. They signed a contract. But now, they say, they weren't told the full story. There's a bitter reality behind the grinding poverty here in the poorer quarters of Mexico's cities and towns. Mexican law has always maintained the fiction that if a young woman agreed to have a rich foreigner's baby, she should only ever do it for altruistic reasons, out of the goodness of her heart. But the truth is, the vast majority of those poor young Mexican women only ever did it for the money. Were you worried about exploiting somebody? No, because Surrogacy Cancun, Mexico, told us that these altruistic payments were $1,600 US dollars a month. So $1,600 a month for the surrogate mother is a substantial amount of money for her to be earning. Yes, absolutely, in Mexico, particularly where the average wage is five US dollars a day. And for us, that meant everything, because that is the change of life that we wanted for these women. In July last year, David travelled to Mexico to fertilise donated eggs with his sperm. Mexico? And six months later, the couple got the happy news that they had three babies on the way through two mums. Did you both want multiple kids? Yeah, that's why we chose two surrogate mothers. Yeah. The deal required that David and Nikki not contact the surrogate mums. All they were required to do was to pay them the agreed $1,600 US a month through the company Surrogacy Cancun. 
At first, both the pregnancies went well. But then David received a mysterious and troubling email. Now, my initial thoughts were, this is a blackmail attempt. Are my babies under threat? I sent an email in reply with two lines, who are you, what do you want? I then got a response saying that I am a close friend to the surrogate. The surrogate is not getting the medical treatment that you are paying for, and the surrogate is not being paid. In fact, as we now know, things were dire for the surrogate mother, Alessandra, who was carrying two of the babies. She'd been bleeding for more than two weeks, but says she was denied medical attention. Did you call the doctor? I sent him a text message because he never answered the phone. He only replied to messages. Were you worried that you might die at one stage when you were bleeding? Yes, I was afraid something would happen to me because I have my own son and he depends on me. What can we do? We're on the other side of the world. And we find out that at one point, Ali uh, was thought to be having an ectopic pregnancy and was going to require an abortion. Fearing for their unborn babies, David and Nikki flew to Mexico and rushed to their surrogate's rescue. Can I hold her hand? Yes. They got her the care she needed. She's our family now. But as Alessandra recovered, she told them that she and the other surrogate mother weren't receiving the 1600 US dollars a month they'd been promised. What did you discover they were really being paid? $800 US a month. Half of the money was being skimmed off the top by the surrogacy company. Exactly. Things got worse in February when the other surrogate mother was ready to give birth. But instead of being sent to a hospital, she was checked into a backstreet clinic. I was really worried. I was really worried. Why? Because it just did not seem clean. Um, there were cockroaches running around on the floor. I sat with her, holding her hand and trying to keep her calm. The brutality of the delivery surprised David and Nikki. It was incredibly violent. I've never seen anything like it in my life. But it was nothing compared to the shock they felt when their first son, Lachlan, became terribly ill. Seeing him was amazing. Hearing him, his little cry, you'll never forget it. Um, but seeing him then be rushed into this incubator is just heartbreaking. There's nothing you can do. It's just, it's heart wrenching. I got to hold Lachlan, and then he had to be taken off me, and he had to be put in, in this room, right? But I couldn't leave him. But it, it, he was my baby. He was our baby. And um, he needed us. Every time he got agitated or cried, he actually just stopped breathing. So they had to sedate him so that he wouldn't move, basically. Little Lachlan needed urgent attention in a real hospital. But this clinic put extorting more cash ahead of providing proper medical care. Doctors here refused to allow baby Lachlan to get into an ambulance that was to take him to a better hospital that had the right life-saving machines. Even though David and Nikki had paid their bill here in full and they've got the paperwork to prove it, the clinic demanded another 2,500 US dollars. It was baby blackmail. The best decision we made was paying that ransom, getting him into that ambulance and getting him out of there. What did you think this whole process was going to cost you? I budgeted on 180,000 New Zealand dollars. What has it cost you so far? It has cost us close to 377,000 New Zealand dollars. Two days after Lachlan's birth, surrogate mum, Alessandra, went into labour with the twins. 
By now, the Beards had demanded to take over all medical decisions. <sighs> She's opened her eyes. <laughs> Babies two and three, Kelly and Blake, arrived safely at the same hospital where their brother Lachlan was recovering. Even though they were never supposed to meet, their shared traumatic experience has brought Alessandra and the new parents closer together. The tragedy is, Ali, that you are doing such a good thing for these foreign parents, but you are clearly being exploited. What, what are your feelings about that? I feel angry. You have given us the family we always wanted. <laughs> you helped us make our dreams come true. It's three of us. Thank mm -hmm. you. How do you feel towards Nikki and David when you see them working as parents? Do you think they will be good parents? Uh, si. Yes, they are going to be great parents for the babies. No new parents should have to suffer the anguish that David and Nikki have endured. With medical problems solved, administrative hurdles appeared, and again, shoddy paperwork from the agency Surrogacy Cancun was responsible. Authorities now refused to issue birth certificates for the children. Well, things for David and Nikki have just gone from bad to worse. They're currently in this government building here trying to get passports for the babies to get them back to New Zealand. But the government here has just revealed it's launched a criminal investigation. They were victims of a fraud. The Kiwis were defrauded. Exactly, exactly. And, uh... Politician and corruption fighter Geraldo Tapia believes corrupt surrogacy in Mexico is out of control and that the industry should be shut down completely. The implications of what you're telling me, though, are very serious. It means that all around the world, there may be parents who think they got children legally from Mexico. Exactly, and they got it from, uh, from pirates. They sharks. got it from, from sharks, from corrupt organizations, uh, from organized uh, crime. L the most probable is that these lawyers in this company went through the corrupt judicial system of they Mexico. Pay, they pay bribes. They pay bribes, yeah, yeah. They, they pay in order to have a legal document that they won't get in another way. We've gone through what no one should go through. I just want to get home and start living like a family. Coming up, alone, broke and trapped in a foreign country. The judge calling for change. We need to do something. And the best friends who made surrogacy work. I just said, look, I'm going to have your baby. That's next on 60 Minutes. The shady world of Mexican surrogacy takes a nasty turn. As we film the clinic where the first triplet, Lachlan, was so ill, Officials inside summon the police. What's the problem? It's a bit of an overreaction. David and Nikki Beard remain stranded in Mexico, pleading for passports for their children, Lachlan, Blake and Kelly. All they want to do is to bring their babies home. But not all surrogacies are as fraught as theirs. Back in Australia, the experience of these two friends couldn't be more different. We'd go down to the park and lie down or we'll just be in the moment together and imagine what the girls were going to be like. Six years ago, Brisbane mother Rosie Lewick made an extraordinary offer to her best friend Lauren Lischnauer, who'd been trying to become a mother for 12 years. I just blurted it out. I just said, look, I'm going to have your baby. We'll discuss it later, but... Basically, <laughs> I'm going to help and I'm going to I'm going to have your baby. That was it. It was surreal. I was jealous that she got to to be pregnant and carry these these babies that I so desperately wanted to carry. But I was also in complete utter amazement and awe that someone would love me and find me special enough 
to do that for me. One, two, go! <laughs> Today, Rosie's offer to be a surrogate mother for Lauren and Myron Lichnauer's children has brought their two families even closer together. To explain it to the kids, the two families have a special name for Rosie. Tummy Mummy. Tummy, Tummy, Tummy Mummy. I love oh, it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Lauren and Myron's twin daughters, Amelia and Saskia, born in 2011, were the first babies delivered in Queensland through altruistic surrogacy. For Rosie and her husband Adrian, making such a kind offer was a no-brainer. It's a huge decision though, isn't it, to have somebody else's baby? It wasn't so at the to time. Me, it yeah. wasn't that, <laughs> like, I'd it's had three massive. babies. I could I knew I was good at it. <laughs> <laughs> I'd had never had a complication. She, like it wasn't a, you just want it to help. was it, I just yeah. wanted to help. I can imagine for both of you guys it's quite confronting. I don't think confronting's a word. <laughs> <laughs> it's like having two wives. <laughs> <laughs> Altruistic surrogacy, carrying a child for no financial gain, as Rosie did, is legal here. Yeah. Is that a face? Yeah, that's a face. But commercial surrogacy, carrying a baby for profit, is illegal in all states and the ACT. This one, 12 weeks, 6 days, that was when I was really sick. Mm. Very few women are willing to take on the task for nothing, which is why so many childless couples flee overseas. I do think we need to do something, and the answer to what we need to do might be to allow commercial surrogacy. None other than the Chief Justice of the Family Court, Diana Bryant, thinks it's time for change. The more conservative view about commercial surrogacy is that fundamentally there's something that people feel is ethically wrong with a woman renting out her body for the benefit of others. What, what do you think about that? Well, I, I'm essentially a pragmatist <laughs> and I, I mean I, I accept that argument that people may feel that way but I say well look what's happening. People are going to developing countries and they are having surrogacy arrangements there and bringing back the children. We have to accept that. We have to do something about it. Commercial, though, I think would probably be a bit easier because mm. there's no emotion. It depends no. who you're doing it for, but there's not as much at stake, I guess, because, yeah. like, our whole relationship was, was at stake with yeah. ours. Myron has two children from a previous relationship, but Lauren was desperate for their own. She endured four miscarriages through 21 courses of IVF treatment. All failed. Was there ever a time when you thought, gee, maybe nature doesn't want me to have a baby? A, a lot of times. Um, I'd question myself um, and berate myself over whether or not it was nature's way or the higher powers to be telling me that I just wasn't meant to be a mum. And all the way through all of this, you've got your mate Rosie, who's Baby's falling out of cupboards. Yeah. Yes, yes, I am. Um, as, mu as much as I love Rosie and loved her even then, there was a, a part of me that would look at her and secretly hate her. So how did Lauren tell you? Oh, well, you were standing I, I, I was standing next to her when um, Rosie said, hey, look, I want to have your baby. And I said, look, hey, you know, I'm not into that sort of thing. But um, then she explained that, you know, she would be the surrogate. The one question I get from everyone is, how did you do it? When you when you have your own baby and you and you see that baby for the first time, like, I get emotional, but it's, it's, I just wanted that for her. You know, you go into it knowing that they're, they're not your babies, you don't go home with them at the end of the day, nothing's related to you. So once my, my job is to carry them, get them here safely, hmm. make, you know, once I've done that, then I can go back to my kids, back to my family, and, you know, my, my job's done. Myron, how important was it for the pair of you that they made that gesture? Oh, it was, it was the most important thing to us at the time. Um, you know, it was the miracle we were waiting for. Um, we tried everything else. You just had given up? We, we had mm -hmm. given up. 
Rosie's first three bubs were a breeze, but she suffered terrible morning sickness during her surrogate pregnancy with Lauren and Myron's twins. At 29 weeks, she was in hospital. Any regrets? Absolutely not. No, no, no way. Even though you were getting no, sick? I, even afterwards, I would do this 10,000 10, times over. Never regret it. In March 2011, twins Amelia and Saskia arrived in the world, and Lauren was the first to hold them. It was, it was unbelievable. I, I, I was so excited and I was, I was too scared to touch them uh, because I was, they were so tiny that I thought that I'd break them or do something wrong. I remember just looking over and I'm gonna cry. <laughs> But I just remember her face and the smile on her face. And I just remember looking at her and I just went, that, that's the reason why I did it. I, I remember looking over at her and mouthing the words, thank you so much. And just praying that she knew how much it meant to me because there were never going to be enough words. There's one final twist in this remarkable tale. To Lauren and Myron's shock, after 12 years of heartbreak, just before Rosie gave birth to the twins, Lauren discovered she was also pregnant. I can imagine you'd be pretty nervous about telling Rosie. I, um, she didn't tell me. I didn't I tell her. <laughs> I, was, I was really scared and we decided because Rosie was in hospital and uh, we knew that the girls were going to be born a ahead of time, we thought we'll let's just focus on these babies at the moment. And it was when Rosie was Leaving. discharged <clears throat> from hospital, so the week after the girls were born, and I um, started to cry. And she's like, what's wrong? And I said, I have something to tell you, and please don't hate me, and please don't be mad. I didn't mean for it to happen. And she said, what? And I said, I'm pregnant. And she burst into tears, and I was crying, and then the girls started crying. <laughs> And then, yeah, it was, it was really, really sweet. What went through your mind when you were told? Um, I was just over the moon. I was like, oh my God, you did it, like, well done, this is amazing. So you didn't say to yourself, I've just done all this God, for nothing? No. <laughs> no. Now she gets to experience it as well, yeah. from the other and side. Yeah. Which tummy did you come from? From Rosie, then Amelia came in for Rosie. Lauren and Myron now have a family of six children including two more kids born since surrogate twins, Saskia and Amelia. <laughs> when the two families get together, it's bedlam. Go to a cafe, and the first thing we do is we apologise to them <laughs> before the kids absolutely annihilate the whole cafe. They take over the whole place, but it's fun. Don't go, not yet, not yet, not yet, not yet. Both couples believe that to encourage more surrogacy in Australia, commercial deals should be legalised. I believe that the government of Australia needs to put a, a harmonious policy in place that benefits both commercial surrogacy and non-commercial surrogacy, but control it more offshore so they keep it within the realms of our, of our country. After what I've seen in Mexico, I think in a regulated country like Australia or New Zealand, commercial surrogacy could be allowed because people's lives could be changed dramatically for the better. After an excruciating eight weeks in limbo, where they feared they would never be allowed to leave Mexico, David and Nikki Beard finally got some happy news. Their babies were issued with passports and late last month, they finally got to return home. Meet your little grandson. Into the warm embrace of grandma. This is Blake. This is Kelly, little granddaughter. And then we've got Lachlan. Welcome home. Oh, hello. Is that your new bedroom? Now. I actually can't imagine what it was like without them. They wake me up all hours of the night for a feed. I'm not getting much sleep. It doesn't bother me. <laughs> I love it. I love sitting there and watching their little faces and feeding them, even changing a nappy. It doesn't matter how dirty it is. It, it, it's, it's 
it's all part of the job and it's the best job ever. <laughs> if you just smile. Hello, I'm Liz Hayes. Thanks for watching. To keep up with the latest from 60 Minutes Australia, make sure you subscribe to our channel. You can also download the Nine Now app for full episodes and other exclusive 60 Minutes content.